Hi, and uh, welcome. I'm um, currently recording with two socks over my microphone. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. Hi, and welcome to the first video in a series on Henry Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy. This video will be an introduction going over the first chapter of Agrippa's first book on occult philosophy, as well as some ideas to keep in mind as we go forward in the series, and some of my own perspectives on the ideas presented in Agrippa's works. What I'd like to say first is that it's imperative we observe Agrippa and his ideas with an extremely critical eye. While Agrippa was progressive for his time, notably for his positive attitudes towards Jewish people and women, there are things within his work that we cannot ignore in today's current political and social climate, such as Kabbalah as a major piece of Western occultism. Kabbalah is a Jewish mystic practice that was appropriated for all intents and purposes by occultists as we move through the medieval period, all the way up to today. This appropriation continues today and is something that we should like view with disdain. From a perspective of justice, that is to say, we should not allow our peers to fall into appropriating Kabbalah or other closed mystical ideas for that matter. There's a saying I've heard from Jewish people defending this point. A man should not take on the study of Kabbalah until they are at least 40 years of age, married, have children, and have studied the Torah all throughout his life. I'm paraphrasing, and this is not to exclude women or others from the practice of Kabbalah. I'd also like to say this isn't a strict guideline, at least from what I've heard, just an example of how committed to Judaism you have to be in order to practice Kabbalah. I say this with full respect and love for the Jewish community, as well as my Jewish peers and friends. If any Jewish people or others have issues with what I present in any of my videos, please let me know and I'll fix what I say and retrieve better information. With that said, we can begin on the discussion of the first chapter of Agrippa's book. Agrippa begins by stating that there are three worlds, the elementary, the celestial, and the intellectual world. Agrippa coins this as the threefold world. There is a lovely blogger on Tumblr by the name of Normal Horoscopes, who was my introduction to Agrippa. The following metaphor is how they line out the idea of Agrippa's threefold world. I've also added in my own little bits of understanding to it. Imagine you're on an ocean, in a tiny boat. It's a sunny day, and the light that shines from the sun is reality. Reality is everything that you can see, your own body, your boat, and the surface of the ocean. Everything that could be considered grounded in reality would reside in that sphere of understanding. Light equals reality. So, for example, um, your cat is pretty grounded in reality if you have a cat. Uh, you see them, hopefully you see them every day. Um, you see them every day, they're in your life, they're existent, you are around them all the time, they're a pretty big part of your reality. So they would reside in the sphere of understanding that is uh, reality shining over the ocean. If you look into the ocean, the first layer beneath you is murky. You can't see as well, things are distorted in the distance, and it's difficult to see very far at all in this layer. This is the celestial world. It operates on the rules of correspondences. If something happens in this layer right beneath your boat, chances are you're going to feel something happen to you and your boat. If there's a current underneath you, you're most likely going to be disturbed by the current. This is the rule of correspondences. Basically, it's what the ideas of macrocosm and microcosms are based off of and in turn, what astrology is based off of. Astrology operates on the idea that the planets are a macrocosm to our individual lives, and we are a microcosm as such, and so on. This is why you hear people talk about astrological events and how they affect us. When Mercury is in Gatorade, sorry, retrograde, there's a tendency for there to be miscommunication. Because Mercury in retrograde is a representation of miscommunication between Mercury and the other planets. 
keep in mind this is not a fully accurate representation of astrology or planetary working, this is just an example. If we go to the bottom of the ocean, it's pitch black. You cannot see in front of you, but there are lights and things all around you. Some things closer than others, some brighter or more hidden than others. This is the intellectual world. Things down here also operate on the rule of correspondences, but interact in a more convoluted way with, with the upper layers, compared to the way layer 1, the elementary world, or reality, and layer 2, the celestial world, interact with each other. Um, for example, the intellectual world is an image of an apple in your mind. The celestial world is a physical picture of an apple. The elementary world is just an apple. Physical, shiny, all there in its crispy red glory. Uh, that's another little metaphor I stole from normal horoscopes. Go check them out on Tumblr. They're great. Sometimes a wave comes up from the lower layers and crashes over you. This is being covered in unreality. This is comparable to strange and sometimes disturbing moments in life when you feel less grounded in reality, when the world seems stranger, when things make less sense than usual. An example would have been the week of the presidential election. Everything was out of whack to the extreme. We saw one of the presidential candidates have a rally at a landscaping company. That doesn't seem real or right, does it? I don't, I don't think so. Um, during times of extreme up upheaval, the ocean churns and waves rise high, and things that are less likely to happen seem like they happen more often. This is the nature of reality and unreality. This also ties into how not everything that is real, or a better term might be existent, is grounded in reality. Things like gods, magic, and spirits, those things are existent but they're not so much grounded in reality like your cat is. That's a whole other video, though. This is the basis for understanding the rest of Agrippa's occult philosophy. It's important to understand how these worlds work, and if you do not understand, well, worry not. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions, and I assure you, things will become more clear as time goes on. Just try and fit that metaphor into your noggin. Okay, let's move forward. Let's talk about Virtues, capital V. Agrippa asserts, seeing there is a threefold world, elementary, celestial, intellectual, and every inferior is governed by its superior, and receiveth the influence of the virtues thereof, so that the very original and chief worker of all doth by angels, the heavens, stars, elements, animals, plants, metals, and stones convey from himself the virtues of his omnipotency, or, I'm um, sorry about that, omnipotency for whose service he made and created all these things. Agrippa touches on a couple things, like omnipotency of a god, and angels and yada yada. However, what we care about is inferiors being governed by their superiors. And listen, I know that whole quote is a lot, but just think about inferiors being governed by their superiors for right now. As he puts it, a virtue is the inherent attribute something receives from the reflection in the world above it. Just as the planet Venus is classically associated with the metal copper, copper contains some of the attributes of Venus. However, these virtues, what we're calling attributes, are inferior and are beholden to the superior virtues contained in the upper reflection, which is Venus. So as Venus lays higher in the chain of worlds, the order goes intellectual at the top, celestial in the middle, and elementary at the bottom. Copper's virtue are beholden to the superior virtues of Venus. As for what virtues Venus is beholden to, this is a question that will be answered as we explore Agrippa's occult philosophy further. It's kind of funky and weird and goes into a lot of other shit, so... Don't worry about it right now. <laughs> the concept of virtues is extremely useful if you are spiritual, religious, or practice magic. It allows you to categorize and use physical objects in order to attain your goals via magical, religious, or spiritual practice. Which brings us to this quote from Agrippa. 
This one's a bit of a doozy, so bear with me. Wise men conceive it no way irrational that it should be possible for us to ascend by the same degrees through each world, to the same very original world itself, the maker of all things and first cause from whence all things are and proceed, and also to enjoy not only these virtues which are already in the more excellent kind of things, but also besides these to draw new virtues from above. Hence it is they seek after the virtues of the elementary world through the help of physic, uh, that means medicine, and natural philosophy in the various mixtions of natural things, then of the celestial world in the rays, and influence thereof according to the rules of astrologers and the doctrines of mathematicians, joining the celestial virtue to the former moreover they ratify and confirm all these with the powers of divers intelligences through the sacred ceremonies of religions. Now, that's a lot. I get it. I understand. It really doesn't sound like anything. It sounds like jibber-jabber. So, I'll do my best to make it understandable. Basically, ceremonies are a process of drawing out the virtues of physical objects, join them with celestial virtues and confirm their intellectual virtues via the religious, magical, spiritual ceremony. You can liken this to blessing an object or enchanting it, bestowing certain virtues on an object, or drawing on the virtues of an object in order to further your goals. For example, burning incense that has certain smells associated with a god you venerate. The virtues of the incense are interacting with the virtues of the god in question. The virtues of the incense being inferior and the virtues of the god being superior. That is a confirmation via the intelligence of the god that you have confirmed that interaction. That is virtues. And that's basically the first chapter of Agrippa's first book. There are certain things that Agrippa talks about, like omnipotence, that I'd like to touch on, and how I approach it as a polytheist, though I believe that's also another video. I'd like to thank you for sticking with me through this ridiculously dense and difficult to understand text. Trust me when I tell you this is as simple as I can make it. If you have any questions, leave a comment, or you can reach out to me on Twitter or Tumblr. Thanks for watching, and remember to like and subscribe.